The case of Natasha Kampusch, a young girl who was abducted and held captive for eight years, has captivated the world and left many pondering the dark psychological forces that drive such heinous crimes. The story, full of human struggle and the triumph of resilience, invites a deeper examination of the minds of both the captor and the captive. By delving into the psychological underpinnings of this case, we can begin to unravel the motivations and intricacies of this chilling situation. One of the most perplexing aspects of this case is the mindset of Wolfgang Priklopil, the man responsible for Natasha's abduction and captivity. His twisted and distorted worldview left him to believe he had the right to control and manipulate another human being, ultimately driving him to commit this unthinkable crime. As we delve into the details of this case, we will seek to understand the psychological aspects that contributed to Wolfgang's actions, offering a glimpse into the mind of a man consumed by darkness and obsession. The stories we discover in our channel serves as a powerful reminder of the importance of advocating for one's own well-being and finding comfort and solace in the face of adversity. Similarly, in our daily lives, we seek clothes that not only make us feel good, but also enhance our comfort and well-being. This is where Allayed Apparel's comfy shorts come into play, providing a seamless transition from the challenges of the day to the ultimate relaxation experience. These shorts are so lightweight and soft that you'll barely notice you're wearing them, making them perfect for lounging at home, running errands, or enjoying a casual day with friends. For 15% off, use the code WICKED15 at checkout, link in the description below. Now back to the video. Natasha, a spirited 10-year-old girl living in Austria, craves the independence she feels is rightfully hers. Her mother constantly hovers over her, making her decisions for her and never allowing her the freedom to express herself. Natasha, like most girls her age, dreams of the day when she can assert herself and show the world she is capable of handling life on her own terms. On one fateful morning, Natasha and her mother have a heated argument, their emotions reaching a boiling point. Her mother chastises her for being sluggish and forces her to wear a pair of ugly glasses. Natasha, feeling humiliated and fed up, slams the door behind her and leaves for school alone, without her mother's knowledge or permission. As Natasha walks to school, she is filled with a mixture of fear and exhilaration. For the first time in her young life, she is making a decision on her own, and she is determined to prove that she can handle the responsibility. However, as she proceeds along her path, she notices a man standing by the side of the road, seemingly waiting for something, or someone. Natasha is momentarily alarmed by the stranger's presence, and a small voice in her head tells her to cross the street to avoid him. But she quickly dismisses the thought as childish and irrational. After all, she's on a mission to demonstrate her independence, and crossing the street would only serve to undermine her resolve. Stealing herself, she continues walking, unknowingly moving closer and closer to the man who will change her life forever. The man, his eyes fixed on Natasha, watches her intently as she approaches. He appears unassuming, yet there is something sinister lurking beneath the surface. Natasha, focused on her newfound sense of freedom and independence, does not notice the danger she is in until it is too late. Wolfgang Priklopil, a seemingly ordinary man with a hidden, sinister side, suddenly grabs Natasha and forces her into his white minivan. The young girl is overwhelmed with fear, her heart racing faster than ever before in her life. We will hear Natasha recount that fateful moment and her experience through the ordeal. Because she provides her account in German, I will provide a narrated translation. I was a third of the way to school when I saw a man in the distance standing in front of a white van. He seemed to be waiting for someone. I wanted to cross the road, but then I decided to keep going straight. As I drew close to him, he moved towards me, grabbed me, and he got a hold of me, and yes, he bundled me into his van. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. My vocal cords wouldn't work. It was just a silent scream. The kidnapper said that if I didn't scream or stand up, but did as he said, he, would not, he wouldn't hurt me. I didn't know what would happen to me, but at that moment, I thought my life was over. Natasha knows that her best chance at survival is to remain calm and use her intelligence to her advantage. As they drove away from her family's surroundings, Natasha begins to ask Wolfgang questions about his life, hoping to gain some insight into the man who has just kidnapped her. Despite Natasha's resourcefulness and determination, Wolfgang proves to be a difficult subject. 
he remains elusive and guarded, refusing to reveal any personal details about himself. As the minivan continues along its path, Natasha's fear grows stronger, but she refuses to let it consume her. She knows that if she is to survive this ordeal, she must remain strong and focused. Eventually, the minivan comes to a stop at a nondescript house on the outskirts of Vienna. Natasha's heart pounds in her chest as Wolfgang carries her inside, her eyes darting around, desperately searching for any clues about her surroundings or any possible means of escape. But her captor is careful, ensuring that she is unable to glean any useful information. Her terror reaches new heights as Wolfgang leads her down a flight of stairs and into a hidden underground room. The room, which will serve as Natasha's prison for eight years, is small and windowless, with only a single bed and a few sparse furnishings. The walls are lined with soundproof material, ensuring that her cries for help will go unheard. I knew the area from that perspective, because when I drove home with my mother in the evening, I always saw the treetops and the power poles, so I knew roughly which direction we were going in. He drove the white van up to his garage, and then he wrapped me in a blue rug and carried me inside. He carried me down some steps, and put me down for a moment, and… at the time I didn't know about it, but he was pushing a safe to one side and opening up everything, and then somehow he carried and dragged me in. Once we were in the cell, he set me down on the floor in the dark. I just kept counting up to 21, that was the seconds, and then up to 60, and then again, and again, and again, so that I knew more or less how long I'd been alone. The first day, he brought me a mattress. It was five centimeters thick. It was just a thin piece of foam rubber. My only cover was the blue rug he'd wrapped me in. I used my jacket as a pillow. I didn't want to take my dress off to begin with. I didn't want to hand over anything of mine. He took my school bag, and he burnt my shoes in the first few days, because he said I didn't need them. The entrance to Natasha's cell is cleverly concealed, in the garage beneath a camouflaged trapdoor. To access it, Wolfgang first moved aside a heavy cupboard and several tires. Once cleared, a safe, seemingly integrated into the wall, is revealed. Behind the safe, the thick wall has been meticulously hollowed out. To enter the cell, Wolfgang crawls backward through the narrow opening and then closes a massive 330-pound steel and concrete door. This formidable barrier ensures that the cell remains hidden and secure from the outside world. Once inside, a sharp left turn leads to a set of double wooden doors. Upon opening these doors, Wolfgang steps down into a cramped cell that will become Natasha's prison for many years. In total, it takes Wolfgang an entire hour to reach Natasha's cell. As Natasha takes in her new surroundings, her heart sinks. The reality of her situation begins to set in, and she realizes that her life has been forever altered by this one cruel act. Despite the overwhelming sense of despair that threatens to overtake her, Natasha knows that she must remain strong and continue to fight for her freedom. She must not let Wolfgang break her spirit or her will to survive. Natasha's new life in captivity is a far cry from the freedom and independence she had longed for. Confined to a small, soundproof underground room, she faces a constant reminder of the grim reality of her situation. The room is equipped with only the most basic amenities, a sink, a toilet, a table, and a bed, and can only be opened from the outside, leaving her completely at the mercy of her captor. Despite these severe limitations, Natasha refuses to let her spirit be crushed, and she remains determined to maintain her sense of self. In a display of her unwavering resilience, Natasha finds ways to adapt to her confined environment. She recognizes the importance of preserving her mental and emotional well-being, and strives to engage her mind in any way she can. To this end, Natasha continues to do math, tests, and read, seeking solace and stimulation in the pages of her books. She also spends time sorting through her meager belongings, organizing them in a way that brings a small semblance of order to her chaotic existence. Wolfgang, Natasha's captor, is a deeply disturbed man with a delusional and twisted vision of himself. He perceives himself as an Egyptian god, a powerful and supreme being who deserves complete obedience and reverence from those around him. In his mind, Natasha is not only his captive, but also a subject that he can mold and manipulate to fit his distorted desires. He insists that she address him as Maestro or My Lord, further reinforcing the power dynamic that he seeks to impose upon her. This deranged man is obsessed with the idea of transforming Natasha into a perfect, beautiful Aryan servant and adoring companion. 
He envisions her as an idealized representation of the Aryan race, someone who exists solely to serve and worship him. To achieve this twisted vision, Wolfgang goes to great lengths to control and manipulate every aspect of Natasha's appearance and behavior. He beats her and abuses her, demanding complete obedience to his every command. He forced me to look him in the eye, or to cast my eyes down to the ground, in a very submissive way. I didn't do it, or at least not all the time, because I won't be forced to do anything I don't want to do. Of course, he got his own back. He kept telling me that I was useless and worthless, and stood no chance of escaping. He liked having someone to dominate, and the more I answered back, the more satisfying it was for him to put me down and dominate me, in order to boost his own self-esteem. He was a man who despised people. He hated his neighbors, although he was nice to them. He hated everyone around him and society, although he pretended to fit in. He begins by altering her physical appearance, believing that this will bring her closer to his idea of Aryan perfection. He bleaches her hair, stripping away her natural color and identity in the process. This act not only demonstrates his control over her body, but also serves as a means to erase her individuality and further mold her into his idolized vision. Wolfgang's fixation on Natasha doesn't stop at her physical appearance. He also seeks to control her entire existence within the confines of the underground room. He documents her life through constant filming, capturing her every movement and interaction. This relentless surveillance serves multiple purposes. It not only allows Wolfgang to keep a watchful eye on his captive, but also provides him with a visual record of the life he has stolen from her. The psychological impact of this constant observation is immense, and Natasha is acutely aware that she is never truly alone, even in her most private moments. The knowledge that she is always being watched adds another layer of oppression to her already unbearable situation, further stripping her of any sense of privacy or autonomy. She knows she is bound to him for her survival. He had to move everything aside before he could open the door. If he'd hurt himself or grown weak, he'd never have been able to open the door. And I'd have been like an Egyptian pharaoh, entombed while I was alive, but later dead and preserved. Despite the overwhelming control Wolfgang exerted over Natasha, she refuses to let him break her spirit. She remains determined to maintain her sense of self and identity, even in the face of his relentless attempts to mold her into his idolized vision. She recognizes that her captor's obsession is a reflection of his own twisted mind and not a true representation of who she is or what she is capable of. In Vienna, Natasha's parents are consumed with worry and despair. Their once happy home has been plunged into darkness by the inexplicable disappearance of their beloved daughter. Desperate to find any clue or lead that would bring Natasha back to them, they embark on a relentless search that would stretch on for years. Their hearts ached with the pain of not knowing what happened to their child, but they refused to give up hope. They tirelessly follow every lead, no matter how small or seemingly insignificant, praying one day that they would find the answers they so desperately seek. Natasha's mother in particular remains steadfast in her belief that her daughter is still alive. She clings to this hope with unwavering determination, using it as a source of strength to keep her going in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds. Her conviction never wavers. Despite the countless setbacks and dead ends they encounter, Natasha's parents never allow themselves to lose hope. They continue to search, fueled by the love they have for their daughter and the belief that they will one day be reunited with her. Their relentless pursuit is a testament to the unbreakable bond between a parent and their child and the incredible lengths they will go in order to protect and care for them. Later, the Vienna City Council offered their help. I went to see them, and one of them said that I should buy a burial plot, so I had a place to go and talk to Natasha. I went outside and sat in the car. I'm going to cry again now. I burst into tears. I couldn't even drive home. What were they thinking? My daughter wasn't dead. Natasha was never dead for me. No one ever showed me any proof. I was never shown anything that proved Natasha was dead. I always believed she was alive, right through the eight and a half years. In a twisted moment of fate, Wolfgang is questioned by two investigators who arrived at his house. They notice that his truck is filled with rubber from a construction site. Wolfgang claims to have been at home on the day of the crime, but there's no one to corroborate his story. Without probable cause to search the premises, the police are left with no choice but to take Polaroid photos of his truck, write a report, and file it away. The report is soon forgotten. As her search continues, 
Natasha endures unimaginable hardships at the hands of her captor in her underground prison. Yet, through it all, she remains resilient and determined, refusing to let Wolfgang break her spirit. She draws strength from the belief that she will one day outsmart her captor and escape the nightmare she has been forced to endure. Over time, Natasha continues to ask questions about her captor's life, carefully probing for any information that could potentially aid her in her quest for freedom. Wolfgang remains a largely enigmatic figure, but Natasha slowly begins to piece together a picture of the man who has taken her captive. She learns that he is a skilled tradesman and that he constructed the hidden room in which she is being held. Gradually, Wolfgang grants Natasha access to the rest of the house. However, her role is that of a servant, constantly cleaning and carrying out chores. If the dishes do not sparkle, she is beaten. If her hair strands or fingerprints are found on the floor, she is punished. Natasha isn't even allowed to cry, as Wolfgang fears her tears might damage his pristine tiles. This behavior further highlights Wolfgang's controlling nature and his obsession with cleanliness. He integrated me more and more into his household. He used me as a kind of workhorse, but he still made sure I couldn't run away and threatened me and kept the house and everything locked. It must have been incredibly gratifying for him to hold someone captive, someone who was there just for him and who not even his mother and grandmother knew about. He was obsessed with cleaning and was always wiping things down that I might have touched. I wasn't allowed to touch anything because fingerprints leave ugly, greasy marks no one wants. He would punish me if I left a fingerprint somewhere, not just because someone might find my prints, but because he thought they looked ugly on the surfaces. He would grab me by the wrist and use the back of my hand to wipe away the fingerprints from the door or from the fridge or the door frame. He didn't want me to cry and rubbed my tears into my face with the back of his hand. Or he'd grab me by the neck and choke me and pull me into the bathroom and push my head into the basin so I couldn't cry anymore. He forbade me to cry because he was afraid that the acid in my tears would damage his tiles. As the days turn into weeks and the weeks turn into months, Natasha endures her captivity with a remarkable strength of spirit. She refuses to let Wolfgang see her as a victim, maintaining her dignity and defiance even in the face of his cruelty. Her resourcefulness and intelligence serve her well, as she adapts to her new life and continues to search for any opportunity to escape. As Natasha's captivity stretches on, she remains steadfast in her resolve to one day break free and reclaim the life that was so brutally stolen from her. As the days, weeks, and months pass, Natasha's resourcefulness grows stronger, and she becomes increasingly adept at finding creative ways to make the most of her limited surroundings. She devises a daily routine that includes physical exercise, giving her a sense of purpose and helping her maintain her physical health. She also develops an understanding of her captor's habits and schedule, using this knowledge to her advantage in her ongoing quest for freedom. During her long years of captivity, Natasha is occasionally granted brief moments of freedom from the confines of her underground prison. Wolfgang allows her to venture outside the room on a select few occasions, providing her with fleeting glimpses of the world beyond her cell. These rare moments serve as both a tantalizing taste of freedom and a cruel reminder of the life that has been stolen from her. Each time Natasha steps outside the underground room, she experiences sensations she had nearly forgotten. The wind gently caresses her skin as she walks through the garden, and the warmth of the sun fills her with a sense of hope and longing. She is acutely aware of the beauty and serenity that exists just beyond her reach, tantalizingly close yet always just out of grasp. These brief excursions are carefully orchestrated by Wolfgang, who maintains an iron grip on Natasha's movements and interactions. He ensures that she remains under his control at all times, never allowing her the opportunity to escape or seek help. Each trip outside the room is a calculated risk, a means of granting her a small measure of freedom while ensuring that she remains tethered to him and the life he has imposed upon her. Wolfgang uses these excursions as a tool of manipulation and control, making it abundantly clear that any attempt to leave him would result in dire consequences. He instills a deep sense of fear within Natasha, convincing her that escape is futile and that her only chance of survival lies in remaining with him. This psychological warfare only serves to deepen her sense of helplessness and despair, further entrenching her in the nightmare of her captivity. Despite the threats and the constant specter of danger, Natasha clings to these brief moments of freedom as a lifeline, a source of hope that sustains her through the darkest days of her ordeal. As the years pass, Natasha's resolve only grows stronger. She becomes increasingly determined to reclaim her life and her freedom, refusing to be broken by her captor's threats and manipulation. 
She understands that Wolfgang's power over her lies in the fear he instills, and she refuses to let that fear control her for any longer. You're locked up there in the dark, there's no electricity, and you're hungry. And you think, what's the point? Why not put an end to this misery? But then you decide that you mustn't give up, because the whole thing is a monstrous injustice, and you mustn't let it get you down, because that would be an admission of defeat. It was some kind of fighting spirit that kept me alive. Natasha becomes more and more resourceful, finding ways to survive and cope within the confines of her prison. She holds on to the memories of her family and the love they share, using them as a source of comfort and inspiration. The hope that her parents are still searching for her gives her the courage and determination to keep fighting for her freedom, no matter how difficult the journey may be. I got everything that you want Like a heart that oh so true Just call on me at the center lot with from me to you. After years of captivity, Natasha's long-awaited chance for freedom finally presents itself in an unexpected moment. She is performing her routine chores, vacuuming Wolfgang's car, when suddenly, he becomes distracted by an incoming phone call. He steps away, leaving Natasha alone for a brief window of time. Realizing that this could be the opportunity of a lifetime she's been waiting for, Natasha's heart races as she makes a split-second decision that will change her life forever. Leaving the vacuum cleaner running to create the illusion that she is still working, she dashes toward the open gate of her prison. With adrenaline pumping through her veins and determination fueled by years of captivity, Natasha races through the yard, her eyes set on freedom. She leaps over fences and navigates obstacles, the fear of being caught propelling her forward. Each step she takes is one step closer to the life she was cruelly torn from all those years ago. He was talking on his mobile, he told me to vacuum the inside of the car, the van, that is. I was doing that, and because it was so noisy, he walked over to the pool, maybe about 11 meters away. He'd left the garden gate open, so it wasn't locked. I grabbed my chance. I left the vacuum cleaner on and ran, really fast, as fast as my legs could carry me. Finally, Natasha reaches a neighbor's house, her heart pounding in her chest as she desperately tries to catch her breath. She has come so far, but she knows that her journey is not yet over. With trembling hands, she knocks on the door, praying that she will find help and safety within. The neighbor, startled by the disheveled and frightened young woman on her doorstep, quickly realizes the gravity of the situation and calls the police. As the sirens approach, a whirlwind of emotion sweeps over Natasha. Relief, fear, and disbelief all mingle together as she comes to the terms with the fact that she has finally escaped the clutches of her captor. When the police arrive, they are astounded by Natasha's story. They immediately take her into their care, ensuring her safety and providing her with the support she needs to begin her journey towards healing and rebuilding her life. Wolfgang, realizing the predicament of his situation now that Natasha has escaped, terminates his own life by jumping in front of a train. As the news of Natasha's miraculous escape spreads, the people of Vienna are stunned. Her parents, who never gave up hope that their daughter was still alive, are overjoyed to learn that she is finally free. After eight long years, they are reunited with their child, and the long process of healing can begin for both Natasha and her family. Throughout her captivity, Natasha exhibited remarkable resilience and strength. Despite enduring unimaginable conditions and suffering, she managed to preserve her sense of self and remained determined to escape. Following her escape, Natasha would write a book detailing her experiences, titled 3096 Days. In this memoir, she recounted her fears and concerns during her years as a captive, as well as the hope she held on to and the potential triumph of gaining her freedom. After her release, Natasha faced the challenges of reintegrating into society. She shared these experiences in various interviews, providing insight into her captivity. She also shared her struggle as she attempted to heal. I'm an outcast for life. I have a sign on my forehead that says, victim of crime. Nearly everyone has a preconceived opinion of me. Only as I get older will I meet unbiased people who weren't around when it happened. In a surprising turn of events, the court granted Natasha ownership of the house where she had been held captive as compensation for her suffering. She chose to keep the house, explaining that it gave her a sense of control over the situation and served as a reminder of her resilience and determination to overcome her ordeal. Let's now look at the psychology behind Wolfgang's heinous crime. 
Wolfgang's actions can be analyzed through the three so-called dark triad personalities, narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy. Examining Wolfgang's actions through the lens of narcissistic personality disorder, NPD, offers insight into the motivations and thought processes that drove his behavior. NPD is characterized by a pervasive pattern of grandiosity, a need for admiration, and a lack of empathy for others. Individuals with NPD often have an inflated sense of self-importance, believing that they are superior to others and deserving of special treatment. In Wolfgang's case, his belief that he was the Egyptian god and his demand to be referred to as Maestro or My Lord by Natasha are indicative of the grandiose self-image, characteristic of NPD. This inflated sense of self-importance may have fueled his desire to exert control over Natasha and mold her into his vision of a perfect Aryan servant, as he likely believed that he was uniquely qualified to determine her worth or purpose. Another key aspect of narcissistic personality disorder is a lack of empathy for others, which can manifest as an inability to recognize or respond to the needs and feelings of others around them. This lack of empathy is evident in Wolfgang's callous treatment of Natasha, as he showed no regard for her suffering or her basic human rights. Instead, he treated her as an object to be controlled and manipulated, dehumanizing her in the process. Machiavellianism, the second trait in the dark triad, is characterized by a focus on manipulation and exploitation of others to achieve one's goals. It is named after the Italian philosopher and writer Niccolo Machiavelli, who wrote extensively on the use of cunning and deception to maintain power. Individuals with high levels of Machiavellianism are known to be skilled manipulators, using deception, flattery, and sometimes coercion to achieve their objectives. They are also more likely to adopt a cynical view of human nature, believing that people are inherently selfish and that it is necessary to exploit others to succeed. Wolfgang's actions demonstrate a clear pattern of manipulative behavior, as he used both physical and psychological means to control Natasha and maintain his power over her. His manipulation began with the abduction itself. By doing so, he created a situation in which she was completely dependent on him for her basic needs. In addition to the physical control, Wolfgang employed psychological manipulation to further maintain his power over Natasha. He carefully crafted the conditions of her captivity, limiting her exposure to the outside world and manipulating her perceptions of reality to ensure her compliance. For example, he provided her with false information about the futility of attempting escape, further convincing her that there was no alternative but to comply with his demands. Moreover, Wolfgang's manipulation extended to the way he presented himself to Natasha. Besides insisting that she referred to him as Maestro or My Lord, he further reinforced the power dynamic between them, positioning himself as an authority figure deserving of respect and obedience. Psychopathy, the third and final trait in the Dark Triad, is characterized by a lack of empathy, impulsivity, and willingness to engage in harmful and immoral actions without remorse. The term psychopath often conjures images of violent criminals, but not all psychopaths are violent, and not all violent criminals are psychopaths. However, what sets psychopaths apart from others is their inability to form genuine emotional connections with others, their manipulative nature, and a propensity for antisocial behavior. Wolfgang's kidnapping and long-term confinement of Natasha, as well as his threats if she attempted to escape, demonstrate a clear lack of empathy for her suffering and a willingness to cause harm to maintain control over her. Throughout her captivity, he subjected her to psychological and physical abuse, seemingly without any reason for the immense pain and suffering he was inflicting upon her. His ability to carry out such heinous acts for an entire eight years, while maintaining a facade of normalcy in his everyday life, indicates a disturbing lack of empathy and emotional depth. One of the key aspects of psychopathy is the inability to form genuine emotional connections with others. In Wolfgang's case, this lack of connection is evident in his treatment of Natasha, whom he viewed as an object rather than a human being with thoughts, feelings, and desires of her own. His obsession with molding her into his ideal companion further illustrates his inability to recognize her autonomy and individuality. Instead, he sought to exert complete control over her life, even dictating her appearance and monitoring her every movement through constant surveillance. Impulsivity is another defining characteristic of psychopathy, and it may have played a role in Wolfgang's decision to kidnap Natasha. While it's impossible to know for certain what motivated him to commit such a terrible crime, the impulsive nature of psychopaths can sometimes lead them to engage in risky and harmful behaviors without fully considering the consequences. 
In this case, Wolfgang's impulsivity may have contributed to his decision to abduct a young girl walking on the street seemingly out of the blue, with little regard for the devastating impact it would have on her life and the lives of her loved ones. Finally, the willingness to engage in immoral actions without remorse is a hallmark of psychopathy. Throughout Natasha's captivity, Wolfgang showed no signs of guilt or regret for his actions. Even when he allowed her brief moments of freedom, such as walks in the garden or trips outside the underground room, he made it clear that any attempt to leave him would result in severe harm. This callous disregard for her well-being, coupled with his relentless efforts to control and manipulate her, underscores the chilling lack of remorse that is characteristic of psychopathy. Thank you to our Patreons. We really appreciate your support. We want to give a big thank you to Dark Entries, Nexus, Big Pepperoni Pizza, Chrissy R, Catherine D, Tony S, and Jennifer S. Feel free to join our Patreon today. Link in the description below. Thank you for watching and join us next time when we explore the psychological maze of some of the most wicked people.